Welcome everyone to this month's webinar, Adventure is Still Possible with Parkinson's. My name is Donna Greening and I'm a Programs and Services Coordinator at Parkinson Canada. Before we begin, there are a few items I want to go over. From coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territories of Inuit, Métis and First Nations peoples. To access closed captioning, click on the CC Live Transcript button and then click on Show Subtitle. If you'd like to submit a question for our presenter, be sure to write it in the Q&A window. The chat window is there for you to say hello and talk amongst yourselves. Before we begin, we're going to share a video message from our president and CEO, Dr. Karen Lee. Over 100,000 Canadians live with Parkinson's. We have one of the highest rates in the world. My name is Karen Lee. I'm the CEO of Parkinson Canada. My late grandfather lived with Parkinson's disease, and I know very well the importance of family and how they have to come together to support one another, but most importantly, the person living with Parkinson's. That is why I am dedicated and committed to ensuring Parkinson Canada continues to empower those living with Parkinson's. Each year, our programs and services reach over 10,000 people. We are a community. We are here not only for the person living with Parkinson's, but their family, friends, and their care network to ensure we all continue to thrive. Our advocacy efforts are focused on raising the voices of people affected by Parkinson's. Our Parkinson Advisory Council is made up of people affected by Parkinson's from across the country. They bring a diverse background and experience, but most importantly, they provide me and the organization with advice on topics that are important to them and their community. As a scientist, I know the importance of investing in bold and novel ideas that lead to breakthrough discoveries. At the same time, bringing researchers, clinicians, and people living with Parkinson's to collaborate to push the needle in our understanding of Parkinson's disease. We invest in the next generation of researchers and clinicians to ensure that we continuously understand the Parkinson's disease and also the care management of people affected by Parkinson's. When I'm in the community, I want people to know that Parkinson Canada is with them in every step of their journey with Parkinson's disease. People often ask, when is the right time to connect with Parkinson Canada? Is it when they have their first diagnosis? Is it when their symptoms get worse? Or is it when they need more information and resources? The answer is now. Researchers and clinicians are working tirelessly to find the cure. Meanwhile, every single day, 25 more Canadians are diagnosed with Parkinson's. Our goal is to empower people affected by Parkinson's to live well now. Now let's get started. For someone living with Parkinson's, adapting to change is an important factor in being able to do the things that bring you joy and fulfillment. Over time, symptoms will change and new ones may emerge. So adapting how you do things or perhaps pivoting to try something new becomes even more important. I've asked some members of our Parkinson's community to share how they've incorporated adventure into their own lives. These are their stories. diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in June of 2021. Until then, I'd been a very active and engaged person involved with sports and eventually running a breeding business for racehorses with my husband. During that time, I delivered over a hundred foals at our farm. I had learned to ride when I was five years old and had been involved with horses all my life. I realized it's a huge privilege to own a horse, and I had never anticipated that this would be such a critical part of my life in my later years. When I was 70, I went out to look for my dream horse. I wanted a gray Arabian mare of a specific size. I found her. 
and named her Akira, which means last one or final in Arabic. We will grow old together. This year, I rode Akira four days a week for eight months of the year. We ride in the Ganaraska Forest, which is a 12,000 acre conservation area with wonderful trails throughout. I feel a great sense of joy and harmony with my horse. Riding is for me an escape from the ordinary, and I am honored and delighted to be able to enjoy Akira and replenish my body and my soul. For everyone who sees this video, I would like to invite you to find your own source of joy. It might be swimming, dancing, walking the dog, yoga, playing cards, learning a language. Loving what you do gives you more energy, more interaction with other people, and a great satisfaction in doing something well. Akira is my partner in seeking joy, and I wish all of you joy as you live your life with Parkinson's disease. And now, I'd like you to meet Akira. Because my love is here to stay Hi, I have been involved in the skiing industry for some 55 years now, working as a ski patroller through high school and as a ski instructor afterwards until I was diagnosed. I have also enjoyed just skiing for fun. Since my Parkinson's diagnosis 20 years ago, I've continued to enjoy the sport and have recently been on hill training once a week with the Just For Fun Ski Club. I attribute a lot of my remaining ability to get down the hill safely to a combination of my muscle memory and the fantastic support of the ski, ski club's professional instructors. But that's not where it ends, because during the off season and throughout the year, I work with a personal trainer in Bradford, Ontario. My trainer, Dane Cowell, keeps me in decent shape through weight training so I can physically handle the slopes. The exercises I do also help me maintain my balance and flexibility too. Oh, and by the way, I also have had DBS surgery and I've made sure that I cleared what some may classify as a somewhat risky activity with a medical team. Sometimes my Parkinson's drains the gas tank quicker than I would like, but I take short chalet rests as required and still find myself able to enjoy it. Every year at the beginning of the ski season, I wonder if I'm going to be able to ski again. Sometimes I'm used to myself, it's a good thing I can ski today because I can't walk so well. But being on the slopes is something I love to do, so I do all I can to stay as strong as possible so I can continue to do what I love. Hello. My life has been full of adventure. I emigrated from England at the age of 18 and taking the ocean liner from Liverpool to Quebec City and then a train on to Calgary was an adventure in itself. The enjoyment of adventure did not stop when I was diagnosed with Parkinson's 10 years ago. In fact, the years since my retirement in 1995 have been one of the most fulfilling periods of my life. Early retirement afforded my wife Mona and me the opportunity to travel. We chose the small adventure ecotourism approach. We learned about the Inca civilization in Peru and climbed Machu Picchu. In Cuba, we had a historical cultural tour of the island. Then we went to Kenya, where we volunteered at an orphanage and went on a safari. During our stay at the orphanage, we met the owner of a health center who was struggling to stay afloat because he couldn't pay his staff a competitive wage. That's when our lives changed direction. Mona and I joined Eganville Rotary 
and with their involvement have enabled the completion of the community health center. The diagnosis of Parkinson's in 2013 didn't change much. A lot of my energy was put into making fundraising presentations and Mona was by my side if I had any memory lapses. Everyone was understanding when I said I had memory issues due to Parkinson's. I also had a sign saying, caution, senior moment in progress, which always got a laugh. Yes, we've had many trips, such as our trip to Nepal, which we took with another club of Gananoque who had a project there. It meant traveling in the Himalayas. Some people went hiking, which we felt was too strenuous for us, so we took a different route. A trip to another small town where we took a course, a course in Nepalese cooking and visited the market. We also took a plane in the early morning to see Mount Everest. We delivered water filters with the group. When traveling, we've made a few adjustments. We talked to the pharmacist to ensure we have enough medication for our trips. We make time to rest more so we don't get fatigued and take things a bit slower since we both have some numbness in our toes. We've also chosen to travel by train to Europe rather than renting a car and doing all the driving ourselves. I also find that requesting a wheelchair and using assisted boarding makes flights go a lot more smoothly too. The secret of our success has been the dedication and capability of our local teams on the ground. Parkinson's has not been a factor in managing these projects but as we age, I'm 82, and the Parkinson's symptoms advance, it'll soon be time to pass the torch. It's my belief that true happiness comes from helping others in need. As a 13th century Buddhist once said, if one lights a fire for others in need, it will brighten one's own way. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 2020 at the age of 48. The main symptoms I felt at that time um, that affected me physically were the tremors in my arms and some stiffness when walking. I also found that my left leg dragged a little bit when I walked. Uh, so luckily, when I started my medication, that changed and I was able to uh, walk much more comfortably. So in 2022, when the COVID restrictions lifted and we were able to start traveling again, I was able to do something that I haven't been able to do for a little while, and that's to travel to Panama and go bird watching. We traveled to Panama to see a species of bird that we hadn't seen before called the resplendent quetzal. What I found traveling with Parkinson's was that I could do the same things, but I had to modify um my expectations a little bit so uh we didn't walk on quite difficult trails we chose trails that were easier um, we also limited how much time we were out birding i ran into trouble one day with uh, my medication so i had packed medication to take with me on my hike for the day and i found when i went to take it that it had turned into a yellow chalky dust but luckily i had extra medication with me if you like being out in nature, you might like bird watching too. So my advice for you, if you have Parkinson's is pack twice as much medication as you think you need and store it in two different places. So I carry mine in my handbag, which I have brought onto the plane, but I also kept uh, a set of medication in the luggage that I checked in. I think it's important to talk to your pharmacist and make sure that you're storing your medication correctly. And your pharmacist might actually be able to create bubble packs for you to carry your meds and keep it uh, safe and dry. I recommend um, choosing easier paths. I also limited how far I walked. Using walking sticks can help with keeping your balance while you're walking. And if you're struggling with Parkinson's to hold uh, binoculars because your arms are shaking and you have some tremors, then you might try carrying a scope, which can be mounted on a tripod. 
I hope you um, try doing some bird watching and enjoy it as much as I do. Hi. I was diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's disease 20 years ago at the age of 40. I've always had a love of wildlife and nature and photography in general. I was planning on doing a lot more of it when I reached my retirement years. As I've become a little less mobile and flexible through the years, I've adjusted to photographing from a vehicle, which allows me to approach an animal without startling it into running away, which they do frequently. We're photographing birds to come to the feed at, at the bird feeders that some of my friends of mine maintain in their backyard. I find interaction with nature helps to keep me mobile and I find it relaxing and peaceful. Here are some photos that I have taken. Hi. The lore of the Atlantic salmon is stronger than the comfort of the couch. Having spent six days salmon fishing on the Marguerite and Medec River at the end of the 2021 season, I have endured some of Parkinson's meanest punches. Try tying a fly on the smallest tippet leader with shaking and trembling hands. Wounds become slower and smaller. I can walk into tent pool faster than I could tie the first morning fly on. Then there's stiffness, cramping, muscle pain, balance problems, impaired range of movements and joints, frustration and anxiety that you feel with the poor quality of your fly casting. This lack of confidence drives you to seek less fish pools where access may be difficult. Tuesday, October 26th, afternoon at the Boar's Back Pool. When all the pain is forgotten, when the line tightens, then the line on your reel begins to spin. The salmon leaps in the air and dances on her tail. You know in the line backing, and the salmon is racing for Jim Esther's pool. You tighten the reel drag, hold steady pressure while hopping down the river with your heart rate at explode. For the next 20 minutes, Parkinson leaves your body. The battle is on and you're finally able to reel the salmon in. A beautiful female, approximately 10 pounds. You handle the fish with all the care of a newborn infant, the barbless white muddler, Easy slips out, and you hold the salmon facing the flow of the river. A strong flick of the tail, and she is gone, on her way to add new life. And you hope that, that maybe someday my granddaughters can experience this wonderful feeling from her DNA. I slowly make my way up the hill to the truck, and the love of my life, and Parker and screams, I'm back. That's why I fish. Well, I hope that everyone found some inspiration in their stories and perhaps can start imagining what types of adventures may be possible in your lives. Short clips of Carolyn's video are from a longer video with credit due to Flirt Photography and Soundstripe. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to Candy Harrington, an accessible travel journalist and blogger and the founding editor of EmergingHorizons.com. A travel journalist for 47 years, Candy has covered accessible travel for slow walkers and wheelchair users exclusively for the past 26 years. She is the author of 19 accessible travel guidebooks, including her popular U.S. National Park series. Candy's work can also be found in disability-related magazines, mainstream publications, and websites. She blogs regularly about accessible travel news, resources, and industry updates on her barrierfreetravels.com blog. A lifelong resident of the California Sierras, Candy now resides in the Pacific Northwest with her travel photographer husband after the Creek Fire destroyed their California home in 2020. Welcome, Candy. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed hearing about everyone's adventures. And hopefully today, I'm gonna to give you some resources so you can all out, go out and have your own adventure. 
Now, as Donna said, I've been writing about accessible travel for 26 years. And in that time, I've seen a lot of changes, a lot of positive changes. And I love sharing resources and tips with people because a lot of people with Parkinson's think that they cannot travel. And I'm here to tell you that that's simply not true. Today, travel is possible. Having your own adventure is possible. It's possible because of changing attitudes. It's possible because of laws. And it's even possible because of technical innovations. Now, I will say the biggest roadblock to having your own adventure is the fear of the unknown. What's going to happen to me when I go out there? And I have what I call the three R's of accessible travel. So in order to overcome your fear, you need to know your rights, you need to do your research, and you need to utilize your resources. And that's what I'm going to try and help you with here today. And speaking of resources, down at the bottom of the page there, emerginghorizons.com slash Parkinson's, those are my resources for all of the URLs and things that I'm going to mention today. So you really only have to remember one URL and that is it. And if you don't have a pen or paper right now, no worries because that will be the last slide also. So let's talk a little bit about accessible transportation resources. The Canadian Transportation Agency developed accessible travel regulations for your transportation carriers. And I have a link here to the laws. I encourage you to read them so you know what to expect when you get on an airplane or a bus. Now, these laws are for domestic airlines in Canada, and they're also for foreign carriers that fly to and from Canada. They cover via rail, they cover Amtrak that comes into Canada from the U.S. They cover Megabus and they cover Flixbus and Greyhound that do come into Canada from the U.S. And they also cover large ferries. I will say it doesn't apply to small regional companies. Now, I also, and there's a CTA complaint link there. If you run into a problem when you're traveling and you can't resolve it with a transportation provider, I encourage you to file a CTA complaint. It's fairly easy to do and it will help travel become more accessible for everyone. Let's talk a little bit about air travel. What does the CTA say about air travel? What does it mandate? Well, it mandates assistance with check-in and luggage. The airlines must provide an airport wheelchair and connecting assistance for slow walkers. And a word of advice here, when you do get to your gate, keep that airport wheelchair because if there's a gate change, you'll need to get to your new gate. Now, the airlines must gate check your wheelchair if you have non-spillable batteries. Gate checking means you stay in your wheelchair all the way to the gate. I absolutely encourage this because the less time the airlines have your wheelchair, the less time they have to damage it. The airlines must also provide boarding assistance. They will help you transfer to an aisle chair if you cannot walk. They will build the aisle chair on the airplane and they will help you transfer to your seat. Canes and small mobility devices can be stored aboard the aircraft, and the airlines are required to make an effort to store walkers and manual wheelchairs on board, too. If you have a power wheelchair or scooter, it needs to go in the hold. Now, larger aircraft, those with wide aisles and 29 or more seats, have larger accessible washrooms aboard. Now, these aircraft must also carry an onboard wheelchair. This will help you get to the washroom. The flight attendants will set it up. They will help you transfer to it, and they will wheel you to the washroom, but they will not assist you inside. Another word of advice, make sure the onboard wheelchair is aboard the aircraft before you take off. Ask the flight attendant to check because sometimes they do get offloaded and you don't want to find out about that in the middle of your flight. 
Now, disabled passengers can also use the largest washroom on board, even if it's in first class. So keep that in mind. And my favorite resource for finding larger accessible washrooms is seatguru.com. And I have that on my resource page. This is a really cool website. It has all the aircraft diagrams. Now it doesn't specifically say, oh, this one has an accessible washroom, but you can see by the diagrams that some of the washrooms are twice the size as others. So again, seatguru.com. And finally, one of the most important things that the regulations require is the full replacement or repair cost for any, any damaged wheelchairs or assistive devices. Now, there are a few things you can do to make your flight a little smoother. I always tell people to check the airline website. Most of the airlines have done a really good job at outlining their services for anybody with disabilities. I also say give at least 48 hours notice for any assistance. And it's also a good idea to know the exact dimensions of your wheelchair. This is sometimes they have smaller aircraft that have smaller cargo doors and they want to know the dimensions. And I always tell people to attach instructions to your wheelchair for breakdown and even include illustrations if you can. And I always think it's a good idea to do this both in Spanish and English. And last but not least, learn how to reconnect your wheelchair battery if you don't know how to. Even if, it, even if you can't physically do it, you can instruct somebody else how to do it in case it is disconnected. I'm gonna talk a little bit about one person, one fare. This is something that's unique to Canada. And I can tell you folks in the US are very envious of you. Transportation carriers have to provide a free companion seat if a support person is needed due to a disability. Now, I do have a link to this on my resource page. And this applies to domestic, air, train, ferry, and bus companies. It applies to people with severe disabilities that cannot travel alone. If an attendant is needed for personal care or safety during travel, then that attendant travels for free. Now, it doesn't imply if you just need attendant care at your destination, and it also doesn't apply if you just need assistance boarding or luggage assistance. Airline personnel will help you with that. It does require a doctor's certification, you should contact the carrier directly to see what documentation or forms they require. And they may require 48 to 96 hours advance notice. Now, the first time you do this, ask the carrier to keep the documentation on file for future reference because it's good for up to three years. Now, you won't have to get new documentation, but you will have to contact the carrier for your next trip. And all of the carriers, the major transportation carriers have really good information on their websites. And I've had, I have links to those on my resource page. I'm gonna talk a little bit about finding accessible lodging. <clears throat> now in Canada, Access and lodging is regulated by provincial regulations, sometimes territorial regulations, and sometimes even local building codes. There's no national access regulations for lodging, so it's not standard across the country. With that in mind, you need to ask a lot of questions. I tell people to call the property directly. You want somebody that's actually at that property to answer your questions. And never just ask for an accessible room because different rooms have different features. Have them describe the access. What features does that accessible room have? Always ask for photos too. If there's any question, very easy today for people to send photos. Now, if you need a roll-in shower, you're going to have to ask for one because they're not standard in all accessible rooms. 
And if the front desk can't help you, ask to speak to somebody in housekeeping because these people are in and out of the rooms on a daily basis and they know what's there. Now, if bed height is an issue for you, you're gonna need to ask for measurements. I've been in thousands of accessible rooms and I have to tell you that I've seen everything from 19 inches to 39 inches. I will say it's trending towards higher beds these days, but again, if it's an issue for you, ask for measurements. Also ask for any equipment that you might need, a shower chair, a toilet riser, a lot of properties have equipment closets and have stuff in them. And again, if they don't know at the front desk, ask to speak to housekeeping. Probably one of the most important things that you should remember is make sure that they block that room when you make your reservation. Block means a specific room for a specific person on a specific day. Okay, guaranteeing is not the same as blocking a room. Guaranteeing in hotel speak means that they're only guaranteeing the rate. So if they say they can't block the room or they don't even know what it is, my advice to you is to do business with another property, one that will block that accessible room upon reservation. Because you don't wanna get to your hotel after a long day of travel and not have an accessible room waiting for you. So again, always make sure they block the room. Well, I'm gonna talk about dealing with off periods and I have days when I feel like this. I absolutely love this illustration here. It can be a huge problem for people with Parkinson's and it even so more so when you travel. So I'm gonna talk about off periods first. Off periods, of course, are when your medication wears off and your Parkinson's symptoms return. Now there's been lots of research done on this. I'm not a doctor. I'm not gonna address it from that angle, but I did find an interesting study in the Journal of Patient-Centered Research and Reviews, and I included a link to that on my resource page. It addresses the triggers and coping mechanisms of off periods. Two of the biggies, stress and anxiety. And those can build up when you're sitting in an airport and you're worried about if the airplanes are gonna lose or damage your wheelchair. They did suggest five top coping mechanisms. Number one, take deep breaths, calm yourself and relax. Number two, listen to some soothing music or relaxation recordings on your phone. Number three, practice mindfulness, try chair meditation. Number four, go to your happy place, remember a happy event. And number five, do something to busy your mind. Do a crossword puzzle or Sudoku. And one of my favorite mechanisms for reducing travel stress is to develop a what if plan for scenarios you might be concerned about. So ask yourself a question like, what if my wheelchair breaks in a strange city? Do you then you wanna find a solution to that? In other words, look up repair and take their phone numbers with you. That way you have one less thing to stress about because you're prepared. And I will tell you another trigger for off periods is forgetting to take your meds on time. And this is especially true when you're travel because you lose track of time and you can even change time zones. So try to be extra mindful of this issue when you travel. Now fatigue is also a concern when traveling and especially when you're traveling by air. Now on the plus side, you do have control over the planning process and you can do a few things to make your air travel experience a little less fatiguing. I tell people get to the airport early, two hours prior to departure seems like a long time, but if you're having a bad day and you need to take breaks along the way, you'll be glad you have the extra time. And if you don't need it, just take a book and chill by the gate. Slow walkers, always reserve an airport wheelchair, even if you don't normally use one at home. Some airports are massive and just getting to your gate may require a lot of walking. You don't wanna overdo it and then be too tired to enjoy your vacation. I also recommend to avoid busy or hectic air travel times. 
You wanna avoid that first flight of the day. That 6 a.m. flight is chucky chocked full with business travelers. Take the second flight out at 8 a.m. or even an afternoon flight. <clears throat> You also wanna avoid Mondays and Fridays, very heavy business travel. Wednesdays are less crowded and you can even usually get cheaper fares then too. You also wanna avoid the very last flight of the day because it's, if it's delayed or canceled, you may have to overnight in a connecting city and that can be very stressful. And last but not least, allow ample connecting time. Not just the recommended time, 20 minutes is the norm in some airports and it just won't do if you have to change terminals, you have to get wheelchair assistance and if you need to stop and rest along the way. I recommend one and a half hours. And again, just take a book and chill by your gate if you're early. It's better to be early than late. I'm gonna talk a little bit about cruising now. Cruises make a good vacation choice for people with Parkinson's. You only have to unpack once and you can visit a lot of ports. Now, I will say there are no access regulations for cruise ships, but most of the newer ships have good access. And the cruise lines have actually been very responsive to the market. The good news is Vancouver, a major cruise port for Alaskan cruises, and an Alaskan cruise makes a great first choice because there are more accessible shore excursions on Alaska cruises than on any other cruises. I do have a few tips for you. For the best access, you wanna choose a large ship, preferably one that's built within the past three years. You also wanna deal directly with the access desk at the cruise line. Don't go through a third party website. <clears throat> You wanna book at least six to nine months out. Accessible cabins are in short supply and this is especially true on Alaska cruises. Now, standard cabins on cruise ships have narrow doorways. So if you need, use an assistive device, you'll need an accessible cabin because you cannot leave your wheelchair or your scooter in the hall. Slow walkers, you're gonna to wanna to request peer assistance when you book and a loaner wheelchair, and they'll take you through all the little stations to get on board. If you need a wheelchair during the cruise, you're gonna to need to rent one. Ask the cruise lines who their preferred providers are, call them up, rent one, and it'll be delivered right to your cabin. <clears throat> now like land, don't assume all accessible cabins are the same. If you need a specific feature, such as a roll-in shower, ask if it's available. Now, if you'd like to enjoy the water, ask the special needs department if any of their ships are equipped with pool or jacuzzi lifts. Many are. And when you book your cruise, remember to request a table near the restaurant entrance. There's not a lot of room between the tables and when everyone sits down, it's kind of hard to get a wheelchair between them. And if you purchase transfers from the cruise line, be sure and let them know you need a lift equipped or ramped vehicle. And I suggest that you do this, remind them again 48 hours ahead of time. If you use a power wheelchair or scooter, ask about the electrical supply on the ship. If it's not compatible with your battery charger, you're going to need to bring a converter. And for easier recharging, I also tell people to pack along an extension cord and a power strip. There's not many outlets in the cruise ship cabins. And I also recommend do your research and book accessible shore excursions directly. And my favorite resource for this is Cruise Critic. They have a disabled cruise travel forum. They've had it for about, it's been going strong for about 29 or 30 years. I've been going there forever. It's one of my favorite resources. The best advice you're ever gonna get is from somebody that's been there and done that. And these are the people on that forum. And I do have that on my research page, my resource page. Now, <clears throat> travel does you have to spend a fortune and go halfway around the world. If you have a limited budget, man, who doesn't these days, you can find something close to home, something that you can do in your own backyard. 
And I put together a few ideas about that and I've listed the URLs on my resource page. First off, botanical gardens. Many have accessible paths and they have free loaner wheelchairs. This is Butchert Gardens in Victoria. It's a favorite of mine. It's beautiful year round. And they even have a visitor map with the accessible routes marked. Museums are also a favorite of mine. I tell people to look for the discount days at museums. Manitoba Museum, the first Fridays are free from four to 9 p.m. You get free admission to all their galleries, the science gallery, and even the planetarium. And I will say that most museums have gone above and beyond in access. Another good resource, colleges and universities. Many have attractions or museums that offer free admission. The Art Museum at the University of Toronto, all days have free admission. And again, many universities and museums offer excellent wheelchair access. I tell people to visit the beach. This is Woodbine Beach Park, it's in Toronto. They have three kilometers of accessible boardwalk and they have accessible Moby mats so wheelchair users can roll out onto the beach. And good news is, and this is kind of a technology thing, many beaches are now getting Moby mats so everyone can enjoy the beach. Now, you don't have a beach near you, look to your parks and rec website for your local parks. See what access features they have and then pack a lunch and go out for an afternoon outing. I also tell people to plan an overnight stay close to home, just an hour or two from you. There are really two benefits to this. Of course, you know it's not gonna be as expensive as a longer trip, but it also works good as a shakedown trip to get all the bugs out. And if things don't go as planned and you're miserable, you can always come home and give it a try another time. I also tell people to try and adapt for Search the internet for one near you. Whistler Adaptive Sports in British Columbia is a favorite of mine. They have skiing, snowboarding, kayaking, canoeing, paddleboarding, sailing, and hiking. And many of the activities are under $100, and a lot of them are in the $25 to $50 price range. So look for an adaptive sports program. I also tell people to visit a national park. Search the National Parks Canada website for one near you. They have accessible trails, boardwalks, scenic drives, and beach maps. Maps, And this is uh, Prince Edward Island, and they even have water wheelchairs that you can go into the water with. And admission is pretty reasonable. Accessible activities are outlined on the National Parks Canada website. I also tell people to visit a provincial park, lots of those around. This is um, Alberta, Peter Lougheed Provincial Park, William Watson Lodge. This lodge was purpose built to be accessible. All facilities are accessible there. And they've recently added some new cabins and they have roll in showers. Now, Albertans with a permanent disability can reserve these cabins 120 days in advance. And out of Province people with a disability can reserve 60 days in advance. You do have to provide the disability, but a three bedroom cabin is just $40 a night. It's a deal. And the park has accessible trails and even access to the lake, William Watson Lodge. And this is on my resource page too. Another provincial park I like, is Parc National d'Aca in Quebec, 35 miles from Montreal. They have two accessible ready to camp tents experience. Canvas tents have wood floors, locking doors, electricity, and heating. They also have a kitchen with a refrigerator and plenty of dishes, utensils, skillet, coffee pot, and a camp stove. They can sleep four, and they have accessible restrooms with a rolling shower nearby. 
They also have accessible trails, boardwalk, and beach access there. These cabins or these clamping tents are just $100. And last but not least, apply for an accessible travel grant from the Curb Free Foundation. This is a US-based nonprofit and they offer accessible travel grants. Canadians are eligible. It's not really a hard process. It's, it's a simple application. They just wanna know where you wanna go, how much it's gonna cost and why you wanna do it. So apply for an accessible travel grant. You never know, you could be going on vacation for free. And last but not least, I'm gonna leave you with my top five tips about accessible travel, hopefully to help you with your future travels and adventures. Number one, start slow, plan your first trip close to home just to work out the bugs. And never just ask for an accessible room, ask for the specific access features you need. And remember, not all accessible rooms have a roll-in shower. And number three, expect the best, but plan for emergencies. Think ahead, always have that what if plan. Number four, if you're a slow walker, always remember to request an airport wheelchair. Some airports are huge and you don't wanna arrive at your destination exhausted. And number five, last but not least, learn the regulations so you know what to expect. After all, you can't tell when something is going wrong if you really don't know what right is. And as promised, I will leave you with my resource page. And now I think we have time for questions. Thank you so much, Candy, for the great information. If you just wanted to stop sharing your screen. Oh, you did. Okay, great. Um, so one of the questions that was submitted was, are there specific restrictions, limitations on medical or travel insurance for people with Parkinson's? Well, not just people with Parkinson's, but some travel insurance policies do exclude pre-existing conditions and Parkinson's would be considered one of those. So you wanna search for a policy that doesn't do that. And I also suggest that you look for a policy that you can cancel for any reason, um, not just medical reasons, because there are a lot of reasons why you, should, you could cancel such as a death in the family or something like that. Great. Um, someone was asking about bike or boat trips and any tips for those types of travel or adventures. Uh, well, bike trips, I suggest um, actually looking to the adaptive sports programs. They have a lot of good resources and sometimes they do um, trips on their own too. Great. Um, is there a van or a specific type of vehicle that you would recommend for road trips and camping, for instance, uh, a conversion van or, or something else? Um, well, I always think bigger is better. One of the, I love road trips and one of the um, great advantages to them is you can take along all the equipment that you need. So make sure you get something that's large enough. Uh, I do recommend a large fan. I have a lot of friends that actually have modified RVs and do those for road trips. Um, it's definitely a lifestyle. You either like it or you don't, um, but they can have all their equipment with them. And um, Fraser Way RV, and they're in British Columbia and Alberta, they even rent accessible RVs if you just want to give it a try and see if that's your lifestyle. Great. Uh, someone has asked, how would one get travel insurance suitable to travel in Mexico if they're coming from Canada? They said they'd hate to fall and need stitches and find out they can't afford a hospital. Well, it, travel insurance is, is very important. Um, I recommend going to a travel agent. They know the top travel insurance companies. You definitely do need travel insurance. Also, make sure it includes medevac insurance. Because if you're injured and you can't fly a commercial flight home, it can cost between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars just for that. And I know, and they won't take you until you pay that money if you do not have insurance. Okay, is there an organization in Canada that can arrange for a travel companion for someone with Parkinson's? That's a question I get asked a lot. Um, 
I do know some people that say they're travel companions. Um, they're not, it, it's not an official business. I suggest if you only need assistance um, at your destination to try to arrange for a travel companion there from a reputable agency. Um, also, one person, one fare in Canada, that will at least help if you need assistance during the flight or the train trip, that will help you out too. But I, I say look to the destination. Okay, great. Um, someone has asked, what if their person with Parkinson's is apathetic or afraid to travel due to dopamine changes uh, before having advanced Parkinson's? They're, the person with Parkinson's absolutely love traveling, but now they're more apathetic and afraid. What would you suggest for handling that type of situation? Well, I think I would probably suggest to address what their biggest fear is. What, what do you think is going to happen? What's the worst thing that can happen? And then try to have some plan in place that if X happens, we can do that. Um, sort of like the what if strategy. And once you have um, you know, things in place and support in place, I think you probably feel a little more confident going out there. Okay. Now, someone has mentioned that a family member has frozen gait and they use a cane and a walker, and they're wondering how they can enjoy any types of adventure safely. And I know you've covered freezing, et cetera, but is there anything else to add to that type of a situation where they might be having freezing episodes or, or using those mobility aids? Um, do they want specific adventures or you mean um, what they, they haven't they haven't really said so I think maybe just a general answer if there's if you've got any other tips um you know I say there's a lot of nice little trails boardwalks short trails where you can sit out and enjoy nature I love the gal that did the bird watching I think that's a great thing because you don't have to stand up or anything you can sit down and watch that Okay. Now, someone has asked um, if you have any hints for traveling uh, for European river cruises. European river cruises are tough, um, especially for slow walkers. The problem, there's, there's twofold. One, <clears throat> cobblestones when you get off. And number two, um, the, the way they dock, sometimes they dock like three boats out and you have to climb on and off one ship in order to get to shore. Um, I've not really had a lot of success or heard a lot of success with people taking European river cruises. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, someone else has asked, um, they said that their husband has several uh, rests and naps during the day. And how would you handle that when you're traveling? Well, it depends kind of what kind of travel you want to do. Um, definitely, if you take a road trip by car, that gives you the most freedom because uh, you can stop and rest whenever you want to. If you're doing um, air travel, uh, you know, maybe overnight in a connecting city instead of making it a long, grueling day. And uh, train travel is great because you can sleep whenever you want to on the train and enjoy the scenery. Okay. Um, someone else has asked if you know of any travel policies that don't have Parkinson's mentioned in it. They've looked at manu at having Manulife underwrite them, and they haven't come across any others. Um, I don't know them personally, but a good travel agent that deals in this daily would. So I suggest that you go to your travel agent and ask them. Okay. Um, are there any accessible bus tours? Yeah, there are. Um, in Canada, the, you know, the buses are accessible. If you're talking about a group tour, a lot of them are making their buses access. I mean, using accessible buses, you do have to give, I think it's at least 48 to 96 hours notice so that you can, um, they can get an accessible bus for you. Okay. Someone else has asked, what's the best way to manage traveling across time zones and your medication schedules. Do you have any advice for that? Well, traveling across time zones is a problem. 
I just say try and some people set like keep one clock set to like home time and the other clock set to where they can catch the airport and like stay on home time to take your medication until you get to your destination and then do the same in reverse. Okay, that's really good advice. Um, can you list types of trips um, that should be avoided based on problems that you might foresee? For instance, you mentioned European cruises and cobblestone. Are there anything else people should avoid? Um, well, it, you know, it depends on your ability. Um, I have, you know, I've known people that have done just about everything. Uh, again, the cruises, the European cruises, um, anything historic, um, you're going to run into sometimes steps and cobblestones. Um, yeah, I, I think that for the most part, there are a lot of things that I've known people that have ridden camels and, you know, gone on safaris. And so I, I think it's pretty much the sky is the limit. Okay. And we've got one last question. Someone has asked, with reduced mobility and flexibility, it's sometimes difficult to fit in an airline seat. Um, and some are some airlines better than others? Um, well, you know, airline seating is a problem. I say if you can afford it, go to business class because they're trying to cram as many seats into the airplanes these days as possible. So, or yeah, or just try to get a seat that is, I like aisle seats because it gives you a little more room to kind of to stretch out, you know, when the airplane's on. So yeah, unfortunately, I yeah, go for business class. Great. Well, thanks everyone for such thoughtful questions. And of course, a very special thank you to Carolyn, Bart, Alan and Mona, Anne-Marie, Gerald and Neil for sharing their adventures with us today. And of course, to Candy Harrison for sharing such incredible knowledge with us. In about a week or two, um, everyone's going to receive a follow-up email with a, with a link to a recording of this webinar and all of the resources that have been mentioned here today. Next month's webinar is actually going to be a two-part series, Creating a Roadmap for the Future, taking place on Wednesday, March 15th and Wednesday, March 22nd. The first session is going to cover care planning, what you need to know to plan for care and health needs, and the second session will cover estate planning, preparing and protecting your future wishes. So watch your email inboxes for more details and a registration link. On behalf of everyone at Parkinson Canada, I'd like to thank you for joining us at this webinar, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. See you next month.